Good news this week on April retail spending, but is consumer strength enough to propel the economy? What it means for your pocketbook next on Quartz Smart Investing. Thanks for joining us. I'm Merrill Brown. Our guest today is Mira Pandit, a global market strategist and executive director at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Mira, welcome. Thank you for having me today. Great to have you. Uh, the national political scene is very much focused on fragile debt ceiling negotiations, but the economy is similarly fragile and uncertain. How do these conflicting signals really tie together, and what does this mean for the climate for investors? We are in a broader economic slowdown. We've seen that the consumer is starting to gradually slow. We're seeing a little bit less confidence from businesses. Housing, of course, has reached a bottom as well. So amidst all of this, investors are very attentive to some of the other risks that are going on in the markets. And one of them is the debt ceiling and whether or not we will default on our debt. Now, of course, this is not our base case. We do not anticipate that we'll default. But what we have seen is that it's smart for investors to consider ways to hedge against some of these challenges. So if we think about 2011 and the debt downgrade that we had at that point in time, we almost uh, reached the debt ceiling at that point. What investors flocked towards were some of the traditional safe havens, whether it's the dollar or gold or treasuries. This time around, some of those safe havens can still work. I think we just want to be mindful of the fact that areas like the dollar uh, are competing against higher yields. So you have a bit of an opportunity cost uh, when we think about gold. And, and from a dollar perspective, Globally, we're experiencing much stronger economic growth outside of the U.S., whether it's Europe or China. So, again, that safe haven bias um, is not as strong uh, when we think about the U.S. versus international as it was at the time. So really what we're geared toward right now is high-quality bonds. Because even if we don't see a pickup in volatility around the debt ceiling, we're still going to see growth slow, inflation slow. And what that means is it should bring bond yields down overall, which can benefit the investor. Meanwhile, you're suggesting there'll be a Fed pause. What are the implications of that and how likely is that? It does appear that a Fed pause is broadly priced into the markets at this point when we look at two-year yields, when we look at the S&P 500 and the resiliency of equities overall over the course of the year. Now, I think we have to start thinking what happens next. Either the Fed pauses and holds, the Fed pauses and then cuts, or the Fed actually realizes they, they need to pause and then raise rates a little bit more. Our base case is by the end of the year, they're potentially cutting rates. Now, that sounds great, lower interest sounds rates. Great. But for investors, that's often not the best thing because what that could signal is the Fed is getting a little bit more nervous around some of the risks in the banking system or that perhaps growth has slowed meaningfully enough to signal that we are starting to head to or already in recession. So Fed cuts are not necessarily good news, but I think that's probably the next stop in this Fed journey. Mira, you're suggesting prudent portfolio management with an eye on bonds and what you refer to as defensive equity. How should consumers respond to that advice? Let's think about valuations in this environment. For the last 10 to 15 years, just to set up some context, when rates were at zero, it was very easy for the broad market to do well. Now with rates above 5%, we need to be more astute about our decision making. We need to be active, thoughtful, selective, and fundamentals matter once more. So when we're thinking about the equity market, we want to ground ourselves in profitability and, and which companies can manage higher wages, can manage higher input costs and some of the different headwinds that are being thrown their way. And we also need to think about valuations in the current environment. And when we look across the board, equities, bonds, different subsectors within both, where we're finding some of the best opportunities are in international equities and also in core bonds from a valuation perspective. A lot of the run up in the market this year has been in U.S. growth, large cap tech. If you own U.S. equities, you probably already have a pretty decent slug of that. So we want to manage some of that concentration risk by thinking about some of the other areas of a portfolio that can help as diversifiers. And by defensive, you mean what? Some of the higher quality sectors when we think about traditional defensives like utilities and, and staples, but also areas like healthcare, traditionally defensive, but also tethered to some of these longer term growth themes. Now, some of these areas of the market have gotten a little bit expensive, so we do want to be mindful of that. But overall, we're thinking more about the quality companies at a stock level as opposed to sectors writ large. So, for example, let's take industrials. That is typically not a great area to be at this point in the cycle. But if you look under the hood, areas like airlines are still experiencing very robust demand. So you really want to pick your spots within sectors pretty carefully. Let's come back to Washington for a minute, though. We can't ignore it. It's an important week with negotiations going on at both the White House and Capitol Hill. 
Address the risks of default and what it could mean. I know you don't think it's the base case, but the chances of it happening are a long way from zero. That's right. So if we think about what actually would happen if we did default, we have to consider that on the one hand, there would be economic turmoil. All of a sudden, you have a crisis of confidence from consumers and from businesses. So you'd see a slowdown in investment, a slowdown in spending. Consumers will get to a bit of the wait and see mode. Let's see how this plays out. So that confidence would likely be an issue. We would probably be pushed into recession. Of course, you would see a more acute tightening in, in lending standards and, and credit. So borrowing would probably dry up for a period of time. So that would very likely push us into recession and perhaps more severe than right now our base case is for the recession we're anticipating. Now, on the financial side, I mean, think about how many financial instruments across the world are linked to the dollar or the U.S. Treasury. So it depends on what happens with currencies and, and with uh, the bonds themselves, but there's a lot of knock-on impacts throughout the system. So it'd create quite a bit of turmoil. I think, you know, conversely, while one of the big topics on hand is spending, it would actually end up having to increase spending because all of a sudden, with such a calamitous event, you'd probably have to see the Fed cut rates pretty dramatically, and you'd probably have to see some sort of fiscal spending to support the overall economy. So it actually um, really reverses out some of the goals of the negotiation to begin with. Um, so hopefully the path of least resistance is coming to some sort of deal, whether it's in the short term or longer term, allowing for a bit more negotiation in order to right size some of the federal finances in the long run, because we do have higher debt and deficits, but at the same time, not have the stakes be default and therefore economic and, and financial turmoil. Well, I'm glad you're confident. Still, it's unnerving and unnerving times. Definitely. Thank you for joining us, Mira. Thanks for having me. For more of today's top business news and insightful analysis, stick with QZ.com.